And y'all follow my mans, man. Y'all show y'all my mans mad some love, man. Subscribe to his channel. Uh, hit the like button and hit the notifications. Or you're going to get bit by the K9. Oh, 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 let's go, chat. Yes, sir. I might have to use that as an intro here. He is a two-time world champion boxer, the oldest junior middleweight champ in boxing history. Has a professional record of 37 and 6. He is Cornelius K9 Bundridge. K9, how are you doing? And thanks for coming on. I'm um, good, man. I'm good, Matt. Appreciate you for having me on the show. Absolutely. So, well, how are you doing these days and what are you up to? Uh, I'm just still training, working out, um, being a family man, keeping God first, um, on YouTube, doing YouTube, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Good deal. And I know you fought as recently as November of uh, 2020. Uh, yeah. Was, and it was against the opponent who was in his late 30s and you were 47 at the time. Was that officially yeah. your last match that we'll see from K9? No, um, I doubt it. I might be fighting September the 16th, and that probably be my last fight um, at the Motor City Casino. Okay. And what, what, what still motivates you to keep on fighting these days? I really, to be honest with you, just stay in shape. Uh, sure. You know, it's harder to train and work out when you, you know, when you not getting paid what you was getting paid to work out. You know what I mean? At yeah. one point in time, I was making lots and lots of money to work out. So, you know, you know, now if the money ain't there, it's like, man, why should I work out? So I got spoiled. So I say, if I got a fight coming up, guess what? I work out again. So that's okay. motivated me to want to fight again. How did you get into boxing? Well, you know, just like every other kid that watched the Rocky movie, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I want to be like Rocky. Sure. Um, then I got older, and, you know, I wanted to be like Mike Tyson, you know, and I ended up boxing. Actually, a young man named Billy Summers, um, God used him to get me in the ring because I had started boxing when I was 11 years old down at the original Crunk Gym when I was 11. Um, I only trained for two weeks because Mr. Logan, may he rest in peace, great trainer, but he wouldn't put me in the ring. And me being from McGraw on Scott, where it was really, really, really rough at, I wanted to get in the ring and, and, and fight. I didn't want to hit no punching bag. I'm hitting the punching bag day by day by day. And I'm looking at these guys sparring. I'm like, I didn't come down here in the basement for this. I want to get in the ring. So he didn't put me in the ring. And I just said, forget boxing. And I um started playing basketball. Right. Seven years later, that's when Billy Summers came because I had a reputation of being a good fighter, you know, on the streets. So you know, he came and rode up on me. was like, man, you want to box? I was like, yeah. He's like, man, who do you think it could be? I said, man, I think I could beat Mike Tyson. <laughs> I like it. I like the confidence. And where did the nickname K9 come from? Um, my cousin, I got a cousin um, who who raps, um, named Lee Sane. He actually thought of a, a name for me, a, a, a rapping name, because, you know, I was a rapper. So I used to be Dr. Chill. He was MC Chill. And he was like, man, you K9. And I was like, oh, it was a group called K9. So I wasn't really feeling it at that time. But then I was like, okay, for good, I'm K9. And I said, you know what? That makes sense because I'm from Detroit and I don't want people saying, what's up, Cornelius? And that ain't no real name that's going to stick out and people going to fear. I wanted a name that was going to be able to, you know, be streetwise, respected, boxing-wise, respected, and rap and rap-wise, respected. So K-9 really fitted me and um, I took it and ran with it. And now uh, let's get into your boxing philosophies a little bit because yeah. I know that, I mean, you've been boxing for a long time. You train people now. Yeah. What, what's your approach to weightlifting? Because I know a lot of boxers avoid lifting weights because they don't want to lose speed on their punches. And I look at yeah. you, and you definitely had, you know, broad shoulders, big chest, big arms. How did you approach weightlifting? Look, man, listen, let me show you something. You see this right here? <laughs> see that egg boy? <laughs> all push-ups. I'm cut push up like okay. what up. Yeah, no weights, all push-ups. Um, if you just flat out ain't got no strength, then, probably, and then you probably should at least lift some weights. Me... I always did push-ups. I used to be, I used to, at 11 years old, real talk, I think if Guinness Book of Records would have been following me, I did more push-ups than any kid ever. I would be in a Guinness Book of Records. From 11 years old to 14 years old, I did at least a 1,000 push-ups every day. Let me wow. remind that. <laughs> I did a 1,000 push-ups every day from 11 years old to 14. 
Wow, that, that that's okay. That that's impressive. See, that surprises me though. Like that, that's that's unique. I I wouldn't have expected that you would have lifted weights because I was watching clips prepared for this. I'm like, my God, she is huge. But push ups, man, a lot of push ups. That's interesting. And then my next question for you is: is how do you handle uh, sparring? Do you mix in hard sparring and light sparring, or is it all just full blast? Oh uh, well, when I'm first getting ready. For- you know, in camp, now if it's first start off, I get a little light work. I don't want to be going hard. And um, let's say I'm not in shape. I don't want to go hard with somebody and I'm not in shape because, you know, if you're not in shape, you ain't even got to be in there with the toughest competition. It can get hurt. So, you know, I start off light and I work my way on up. Okay, good deal. Good deal. Did, did your philosophy ever evolve as time went on or has it all kind of been consistently like that? Um, it depends. It varies. It's, it's different. It depends on, sometimes it depends on how I feel that day. Cause, um, you know, I might feel like, man, I want some, I want to knock somebody out. You know what <laughs> I mean? So I put somebody in there, you know what I mean? That I can knock out, but I'm not a bully. So I wouldn't put you know, anybody in there. I want somebody to think he tough. You know what I mean? Think he can handle these hands. And, um, man, I, I put it on him, you know? So it depends, you know, whenever I, it's how I feel, you know, as a world champion, you know, you get a chance to call the shots that then when you're getting ready for a super fight, you know, you paying these fighters. So, you know, they going to want to get in there with you, even if they're not on your level. But I was never a bully. So if I was ever in there with a guy who wasn't on my level, I would never ever trying to crush him or hurt him when I understand the, the um, sport of boxing. You got a lot of guys nowadays, they get in there and just bully somebody, knowing that they way better than the guy. And just so he can get some attention or they can get some likes and some views, they go out there and bully a guy. And, you know, bullies get dealt with. And what goes around comes around. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, uh, well, let's get into um, The Contender a little bit. You were on a reality TV show in 2006, The Contender. And a really cool story. To start the show, they, they asked all the boxers there for yeah. two volunteers to pick teams. And... Two volunteers, or there were two volunteers, and they picked teams, and you were yeah. last. Yeah. One of the guys who volunteered to pick teams wanted to fight you, and you cited the Bible verse, uh, those who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first. Yeah. Um, and you ended up fighting the captain from the other team, and he wanted you. Like, he was hoping to get you and that they would uh, choose you to fight him. He was excited, yeah. and I watched the fight, and yeah. – it looked like you were winning the early rounds, and he caught a little bit of a rhythm in the late rounds. Was getting a little arrogant, you know, dancing around, and then boom, you knock him down in the fifth round. You get the victory. What was it like to come in as the underdog, as the last pick, and get the win there? <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you know what? That's not, that's what I'm telling you. God is good because um, I had just lost a fight on Showtime where it was a double knockdown with me against the Cool Powell, and um, I put all my faith in God. I said, you know what? Going on this show, I'm going to put God first. I'm going to make sure I'm all about God. At the end of the day, if I keep him first on a real big reality show, um, the biggest reality show, boxing reality show, a combat reality show of all time, I said he's going to take care of me. So whenever I got an opportunity to be all about God, I was all about God. But, um, yeah, when I got picked last, I thought about that scripture. I was like, at first I was embarrassed because I said, they all going to, Laugh at me. You remember the movie Carrie? They all gonna laugh at you. They all gonna laugh at you. So I was like, man, but then God hit me. The first should be last, and the last should be first. So man, I feel good after that, man. Because I you know what? And to be honest with you, that holds to this day. To this day, in my Deontay Wilder voice, because <laughs> I was the last person pick, the first one to win, um, the first one to become world champ. So man, the first should be last, and the last should be what first is real. And uh, Michael Clark, he bit off more than he can chew. You know, uh, he just felt like, you know what I mean, that he had my style. Uh, he thought that he could use me to become a, um, a superstar because, you know, that was an opportunity to become a superstar. And that actually, you know, he actually helped me become a superstar at that point in time. Absolutely. And, I mean, that the verse is so true because I believe it was – if you lose, you go home. So he went home right after that, didn't he? Man, yes, yes. Uh, they put him in a house, you know, they, you know, so he wouldn't go home after, you know, before the show ended. So he stayed probably for the whole show, but you just okay. saw live TV. Okay. 
So yeah, it yeah. truly was the first was last. <laughs> At, that's what uh, I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he really meant no harm. He just was a silly guy. He just wanted to be a superstar so bad. And um, if he would have won, he would actually stole the show because, you know, he, Michael Clark is a very, very funny dude. He's a silly dude. I can tell you some stories about him. Now, while we, right before we started filming, Michael Clark, he telling guys, man, because they didn't want us to talk, you know, to each other because they want us to get to know each other on the show. So Michael Clark, you know, we in a hotel room. He like, man, forget all that, man. I'm talking, man. I'm a grown man. I'm a, I am can say what I want to say. Later on that night, he gets, he becomes friends with this one guy. They go by liquor. Um, one of the guys, a lot of people don't know that a guy named Golden Johnson. Golden Johnson was supposed to be on the show. And uh, him and Golden Johnson and some other dude that they had met, they out there drinking and stuff, man. This guy ended up, uh, Michael Clark ended up leaving and taking the guy's liquor. So the guy, Golden Johnson, ended up fighting and everything <laughs> over, over what Michael Clark did. So he was something else, man. Wow. Yeah. And then, then your next fight was against uh, Walter Wright. Yeah. You, you definitely were, were talking some smack beforehand, playing some mental mind games. What was your approach throughout your career with mental warfare before the fight? Well, you know, with my, now let me tell you one thing I said to myself um, on the show, I wasn't going to mess with nobody. But one thing about me, I'm a cleanup man. If you start something, you better finish it. Because if you don't, if you start it, I'm going to definitely finish it. So I said, I'm not going to mess with nobody. The first person that was messing with me on the show was Walter Wright. Walter Wright was throwing little pieces of paper at me while we on the bus. And I'm wondering, I'm like, who is that doing that? And he was throwing pieces of paper at me. And I'm like, and I said, whoever, whoever doing that, they going to feel me. And it ended up being him. You know, so it kind of reminds you like when, you know, when you in jail. Because on the continue, that stuff was kind of like, man, listen, filming it wasn't good to me. You know, I hated it. It took your phone from you. It took all your certain things that had, na- you know, any name on it. So you couldn't communicate with your family. You couldn't cl- communicate with nobody on the outside world. So it was like jail. And, and a lot of the fighters were acting like it was like jail because they was trying to pick, figure out who was the weakest link. And so Walter Wright thought I was the weakest link. I was trying to see was I the weakest link or was I really tough? Oh, he from Detroit, but is he really tough? That's why he was throwing a piece of paper at me. And uh, Michael Clark, he was, if you go, if you go rewind it and you go look at what he was saying, he was like, oh, yeah, I see what my eyes need to see. Because he thought that I, and not knowing I was baiting them. I wasn't giving them my whole style when I'm sparring. I know guys looking at me to see what kind of style I got and what I'm going to do. So I actually tricked them. You know what I mean? I was the smart one. You know what I mean? People think because I didn't graduate that I wasn't smart. But, man, I got a lot of this up there. Good deal. No, any. You ended up being Walter Ron after that fight. Is that what you yeah. said? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Walter, listen, Walter should never mess with me. He started walking around the house. Now, this, people didn't see all that. You know what I mean? Because it made it seem like I was trying to bully him and all that, but it was the other way around. Yeah. He was walking around the house, Seattle, Seattle. And I'm like, man, Seattle. I'm like, man, Seattle ain't got nothing on Detroit, man. At one point <laughs> in time, and I'm not bragging about it, but it's the murder capital. Seattle yeah. ain't tough, you know what I'm saying? So he's trying to get in my head, and I just took I, – I, I couldn't take no more. I started letting him know, like, bro, man, listen, man, I'm not trying to hit none of that. I started letting him know, like, bro, it, man, listen, if we have a fight, you don't get that work. I just – he took it there with me, so I took it there with him. So you're very open about your, your faith, and especially watching you on The Contender, you're, you're very open on what your faith and how they kind of led into your boxing career. Do you want to – dive into what your faith has meant to you over the years in your boxing journey? Well, yeah, definitely. Um, Man, faith is very important. Um, I wouldn't have became a world champion if I didn't have God in my life. Um, I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for God. You know, I went through a lot of rough times in my life. You know, I'm street dude, fighting for nothing, selling drugs, getting shot at, just all kind of stuff. So it was very important to get God in my life and realize why I was alive. And, um, you know, why I'm boxing and, you know, why I'm able to be a um, world champ. Um, before I became world champ, you know, I had realized it was really a guy. I remember my grandma was about to pass. And uh, my grandma was the one who actually introduced me to God, like started telling me more about God. And my wife, you know, she actually introduced me to Jesus. But, um, yeah, she um, was telling me about God. And, man, and I, one day I just was like, she was about to pass. And I was like, God. If you let my grandmama live, 
I would stop selling drugs. And um, she was on the verge of dying. She was in a, um, a old folks home at the time and she was looking good. And um, I went to go see her again and she was, hey, she was upbeat, looking good, you know? And I was like, man. So I just kept my, my, my um, I kept my word. And uh, man, God is real. And you know, just when you ask for something and he give it to you, you just better, you know, be thankful. And um, God really showed me that he's real. I remember asking him one time for a certain female. I said, God, I'm just walking down the street. I didn't really know who God was. And I just was, you know, just talking out loud. And I said, God, send me a female for me. I said, let her be taller than me. Let her be athletic. Let her be a virgin. And let me meet her at church. Well, over the time, maybe it was a few months later, I met this young female at a church. And when I saw her in the audience, she was taller than me. She was like a giant. I said, wow. And um, I got her number. We talked. And um, as the time went by, she told me she was on a basketball team. So it started clicking in what I said. I wanted her to be an athlete. Um, I wanted her to be a virgin. I wanted her um, to meet her at church. I wanted her to be taller than me because I wanted my sons to be tall, you know? And um, yeah. so I remember the last thing that really got my attention. I dropped the phone because this is when you had the phone booths, you know, before the cell phones and everything like that. So, um, and she was like, yeah, and I'm a virgin. I dropped the phone. I was like, wow. I remember everything I asked God when I was walking down the street. So can't nobody tell me that it ain't no God. So my faith in God just got stronger and stronger and stronger. Now, I did backslide here and there. Nobody's perfect. But I always kept a close contact with God. Well, that's, that's an awesome story, and I appreciate you sharing that. And um, next, I want to get into your title fights. Um, your first one, you came in as a challenger for Corey Spinks, and you were 37 years old. What was your mindset heading into that fight? Man, I want to be a world champ. You know, I, want, I always said to myself, if I fight Corey Spinks, I'm going to knock him out. Because when I was up and coming and I didn't have that much experience, he called me out. He was trying to fight me when I, man, I was a baby in the game. You know, I mean, I think I only had 11 pro fights or maybe it was even seven or eight pro fights. And if I would have fought him, he'd have beat me easy because I didn't have no amateur experience. I didn't have that many amateur fights. So I was learning on the job. So I always told myself, if I ever fight him, I was going to give him that work. So I'm going to that fight. You know, he was not ready. I was ready the first time the fight was signed. They kept pushing the fight back time and time again. The fight was rescheduled postponed at least three times, two to three times. So I just kept getting better and better. I kept getting stronger and stronger. And um, I knew once I got in the ring, they was going to be screaming, stop it! And on that, in both fights, really, against him, but you hit yeah. him with bombs. Like, yes. loud bombs. Yeah. I, I, I'm impressed that he lasted as long as he did. It wasn't that long, but he, I mean, he took some punishment from you. It, it was brutal. <laughs> And then your your next fight. So after you win the title, your first defense is against Powell, who we talked about earlier with the double yes. knockdown. I yes. mean, how amped were you? And Powell handed you your first loss. You started off, I believe, 22 and 0, and then or 21, 21. and 22, 21. Yes. And he handed you your first loss. I mean, how fired up were you to get an, another opportunity at him with the stakes so high? And, you know, it's crazy because, um, you know, the Bible says the first should be last, the last should be first. So he was up here. When he beat me, I was down on there. But then, man, listen, within a couple of years, he was down on there. I was up here. The first should be last, the last should be first. So I always tell myself, like, if I ever got in the ring with him, I was going to get him. I was going to show him that it was a fluke when he won that first time because I was promised $10,000 for a first-round knockout. Let me rewind that. I was promised ten thousand dollars for first round knockout, so I went out there trying to get him, trying to get that extra bonus. Not respecting him as a man, and just thinking I can go get this money, and it came back to haunt me. But um, in a rematch, man, listen, I was like, since I had passed him up, I wasn't gonna go backwards. I wasn't looking in my rearview mirror. I was looking through the windshield because I wanted to fight guys like Floyd Mayweather or Manny Pacquiao or Miguel Cotto because I became a world champ. 
I was a fan yeah. favorite, only contender, and I won a bronze medal. But once he got in a position and became the number one mandatory to my title, let me rewind that. When he became the number one mandatory to my title, I was like, stop it. I was so happy. I was like, I'm going to get that boy that work. I'm going to get that boy that work. And I beat him so bad. I remember him going to his corner. I think it was a fourth or fifth round. I don't know, quote me on it. But he kicked the bucket going into the the going into the corner. He just couldn't believe that I was doing that to him. Yeah, no, that that was a brutal fight. Another brutal fight. And yeah, I wouldn't want to be going against you that fight because I could just see it in your eyes. The canine, he was ready to back up the bark with some bite there. It, it, it was you were ready to go. The eyes, the eyes were intense. Um, yeah. But then. Uh, you recaptured the belt a few years later against Carlos Molina and yes. became the oldest IBF uh, junior middleweight champion Let's ever. Let's go, champ. Let's yes, go. Yes, sir. Yes, Rewind sir. You were <laughs> 41 years old. Let's you go, were champ. 41 years old. Your opponent was 31 at the time. Yeah. And it was in his home country of Mexico. I mean, what was it like going on the road 10 years older than your opponent and becoming the champion again? Oh, you know what, me, what me. You know, if I ain't got it, I ain't got it. I really never look at my age on if I got it or not because I started boxing late. So I had a lot of more years than left in me. And whatever I did in life, whether it was boxing, because I started boxing, like I say, at 18. Because mm-hmm. even though I started at 11 years old, you can't really count it. So I didn't take no wear and tear. I didn't even spar when I was 11. So I came back at 18. So all the wear and tear that guys like Mayweather may have had from boxing when he was about three to four years old, from all the yeah. miles he was running, I didn't have all that wear and tear. So going into the, the fight with uh, Carl Spallina, even though I was 41 years old, I felt like I was 22 years old. And I trained like I was 19 years old. Man, yeah. that was the best shape i ever been in. And it was bad. And it was a shame that I got robbed in a fight against Ishe Smith when I fought at the Masonic Temple in Detroit in my own hometown. But, you know, God don't like ugly. He lost his title in the very next fight. And I had to clean that mess up. So I went to go take the title from the man that beat the man, Carlos Molina. And yep. um, they tried to cheat me. They had it so hot in the arena. They wanted me, you know, because I was older. They felt like because of the pressure and the style Carlos Molina had that I would fold or I would get tired because of how hot it was in Cancun. And I think they turned the heat off or, or they turned the heat up on purpose, bro. It was crazy. You got to go look at that fight. The referee shirt was silky, wet, sweaty. And even the IBF president came in there and told me, man, get plenty of water because Carlos Molina at the time, I don't know if he actually did it, but was convicted of um, molesting or, or being with a, a minor. So he got deported to Cancun, Mexico. So, you know, they wanted me, they was rooting for me because I represented the IBF well when I was the current champ at the time. They wanted me to beat him. So I had to whoop that trick. Whoop that trick. Yes, Good sir. Deal. Good deal. Yeah, no, that... That was intense. And then after the fight, it looked like, you know, they were announcing the winner in Spanish. And it looked like you thought that you lost. But then yes. they finally, after a bunch of, you know, after a bunch of words in Spanish, they finally said, k is the yeah. winner. Yeah, yeah, I heard him say like, oh, 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 Melina. I heard him say Melina. I said, Melina? <laughs> what? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> man. But then I said, oh, okay, okay. Because, man. I thought they gave, was giving it to him, boy. Even though I knew I had won, you know. Yeah, and, and throughout that fight, I, I, I saw you. Um, you, you were smiling a lot at Molina. Was that some mental warfare right there? Of like, course, of course. You gotta do whatever you can to win. I will tell you something that was funny though. Um, in a way, in I was like, "Yeah, you scared? You scared?" He was like, "What? Scared?" He started laughing like, "Man, I ain't scared." I was trying to get his head, and it, it, that one actually backfired. Like, "Man, scared? I'm a fighter." You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I, I told him, I told him he was scared. And he was like, "Yeah, right, I'm scared." Like, come on, man, I'm a Mexican, <laughs> so it's what we do. And I was like, "Yeah," but yeah, I did. I I was smart to try to get in his head, but what well, nothing I did it got in his head. You know, I had to put them hands on him, or as a canine, I had to put them paws on him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and so you talked about how in your amateur career. You didn't. You didn't have a long amateur career. Less than fifteen amateur fights. Yeah, ten, that, ten or less. Ten or less. Okay, so you talked about how that kind of helped with your longevity in the sport. But what did you do to help? You know, as you were getting older, what did you do to help 
uh, combat father time? What do you do focus uh, on with diet and training? Man, man, keeping God first. You know, that was that's number one. Um, eating right, you know, staying out, out the streets, you know, uh, resting, you know what I mean? Not messing with drugs, you know what I mean? Not messing with, you know, drinking. And um, that preserved my body, working out, staying in shape, you know, um, staying committed to my wife, you know. That right there helped me a whole lot. Learning, learning, continue to learn. You got to continue to learn. You know, you can't stop learning just because you ain't in school no more. You know, we always in school. So yes, that sir. really helped me, you know, preserving my body, man, not out here, you know, putting the wrong things in my body. So even at 49 years old, you know, I might not look at like a 49 year old. I definitely don't look like a 49 year old. You know? <laughs> arr, 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 let's go, champ. But um, yeah, man, God is good. I get God all the glory. And um, man, I just, you know, it's all up to him. You know, you could you can eat right, do right, you know, and you can still look a certain way, feel a certain way. And I'm just thankful to God that, you know, I'm, I'm all right. I'm good. I'm happy. Um, I'm, I actually might be more happier as a, a former champion than I was as a current champion because I don't have the fake people around me now. You know what I mean? You know, um, they like, oh, yeah, he ain't champ no more. Let me go on and be a sack chaser to who got the bill now or who's a current world champ now. You know what I mean? So, and I'm still doing good. You know, got my house that I stay in that I own. Um, you know, you know, I'm doing pretty good, man. And I thank God for that. My wife, she loved me like if I was current, you know what I mean? My kids, they don't look at me as, oh man, he's a boxer, he's a champ. Get a chance to spend more time. I get a chance to get some nookie nookie. <laughs> so God is good, man. You know, when you got a bike coming up, you can't mess with your wife. You gotta be, you know what I mean? It's like she looking at you like, dang, I like that you boxing, but I don't like that you boxing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so but I'm, I'm thankful, man, that, you know, I can do what I want to do. When I want to do it, you know what I mean? I ain't got to be irritated. I don't have to worry about seeing good food being cooked by the wifey, and I can't eat none because I got to make weight. So, you know, I can't understand when people retire, why they get to crying. Like, bro, you ain't got to get hit no more. Why is you crying? <laughs> you can eat what you want to eat, bro, especially if you're a welterweight or a junior middleweight. Only the heavyweights got it good. You know what I mean? They can eat what they want to eat. Cause they don't have a weight limit, but you know, man, I will never go cry when it's over. It's over. Stop it. No, yeah, it's awesome to hear. And what was your biggest weight cut in your career? And what was your, your normal weight? Like your normal weight walking around when you're training, but not necessarily cutting for a fight, man, listen, I had weight problems. You know what I mean? I ain't going to say I can't wait to eat, but no, I had weight problems. Definitely. I always walked around bigger. Um, the, the most weight I cut was in a Joe Julio fight. A lot of people think, oh, man, Joe Julio got you and you, uh, man, listen, me going eight rounds, me making weight was an accomplishment. I was 187 when they called me for that fight. I had three weeks. I was out of shape, and I had three weeks to get that weight down. So in three weeks, I went from 187 to 151. I lost 36 pounds. Yeah, 36 pounds. Let me rewind wow. that. 36 pounds in three weeks. Out of shape. I remember the phone ringing. I had two large pieces in my hand. And Jeff Wall was like, rest in peace of Jeff Wall. He was from the contender because I was signed with the contender, the reality show. He was like, oh, K-9, I guess you'll fight K-9. Yes, we. I said, oh. I was happy, but I was hurt. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. man, when the referee stopped the fight, I was like, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> because I ain't had no energy, man. I was messed up, y'all, you know, and I learned from that. I'm never, ever going to cut that much weight, you know, um, you know, three weeks before the fight. I'm never going to be up that high in weight or I'm not going to never cut that weight, um, cut that much weight because it's not healthy for you. You know, I remember after the fight, I couldn't hardly see real good because the water did not get to my brain in time. You know, you know, that water has to keep travel and get back to your brain when you're losing all that weight. So you know, you gotta have enough time to hydrate to get your strength back after a, a big cut like that. And yeah. um getting hit with punches and go I'm, and then he was a puncher. He wasn't just on anybody. I think he was like what 37 and oh with like 36 or 35. He had a good knockout ratio. He was putting guys to sleep. So to get mm -hmm. hit by a guy with all them knockouts for me for that many rounds, you know, and I wasn't going nowhere because I ain't no punk or nothing. Man, it did a lot to me, you know. But thank God I bounced back, you know what I mean? You know, because one thing God made your body to be very strong and it can really heal itself. Or, you know, I ain't taking no nothing from God. He blessed me. 
I, I'm back, y'all. That's right. Good deal. And we talked earlier about your age. Um, yeah. What age do you think was your peak in the ring that you were in your prime? Um, 37. 37. Or, or actually 41 or you 37, either one, because at 41, I was in the best shape of my life at 41 mm-hmm. when I fought Carlos Molina. Uh, I, that was the first time I actually hired a personal trainer. Uh, shout out to Coach Jay. Uh, man, and uh, shout out to Third, man. We, we worked hard for that fight. I was in the best shape of my life, but I would think at 37, I was in my peak. When some guys at 29, their career is over with. It's over. Yeah. It's over. But I was just getting myself started. I had just got the – the contender, to me, was like a part of an amateur career that I didn't have. It gave me the experience that I definitely needed to compete and to actually, you know, become a world champ. But, um, yeah, I would say at 37, I was actually in my prime. For far as skill-wise, you know, I mean, I was in my prime, you know, uh, all the way to 41. But I didn't have the skills until I got older. You know, it took me a lot of sperm. It took me a lot of, you know, training, a lot of watching videos, you know. But at 37, oh, my goodness. And at 41, oh, my goodness, you know. Yeah, that, that's incredible because that's really rare for, like you said, people, people, some people slow down when they're in their upper 20s, lower 30s, yes. like you said. Yeah. So, yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Um, so, my next question for you is when you reminisce on the great career that you had, which fight are you most proud of? That's a good one. I mean, I would have to say all, all, of, all these fights are equal. Uh, the fight, the, the, the second fight, you know, revision my loss to Saku Pal, uh, winning that fight over um, in Germany to become the number two mandatory fighter for the IBF world title against Basagorov, Zerbiak Basagorov on a Klitschko, under, the Klitschko undercard in Germany. Um, when I won my first world title against Corey Spinks, when I defended the belt against Corey Spinks, um, man, when I, when I dedicated um, the win over Bravo, um, when I beat um, the Bur- yeah, Bravo at the Staples Center, and I dedicated the, the fight to my sister because she had got killed. Um, that was special. Uh, it was a lot of special fights. You know what I mean? It's like I got like six of them. I really can't say uh, when I became the oldest world champ in junior middleweight history to this day, the oldest junior middleweight world champ of all time. I mean, it's a lot of them. It's like it's hard to really, you know, say which one was um, the better victory or the better fight. You know, I'm more proud of all of them. I think are they stand on the same um, same scale. Okay, good deal. And then my last question about your career is, were you ever close to fighting Mayweather or Canelo? Yes. Actually, you know, Corey' boxing name is called The Jinx. And you know when I beat Corey Spinks the first time, Mayweather was at the fight. And um, Don King, oh, and my Don King voice, oh, K-9, I love you, man, I love you, man. Don King told Mayweather that when Corey Spinks beat me, he was going to have Corey Spinks fight Floyd Mayweather. And um, so when I knocked Corey Spinks out, I went up to Floyd and, and was like, what's up, Floyd? Because me and Floyd was cool. And he was turned his back, put his hands up. And I'm like, why you do that? Oh, now I'm a world champ. So, oh, he thought it was a setup because Don was a dirty promoter, you know. And um, so he he thought that Don set him up. He, he's like, oh, no, nah, we, we ain't fighting K now, you know. Uh, but later on, and, and you know, in my career, or after, you know, my career, or you know, after I became world champ, or, or anyway, when I talked to um, Mickey Bay, I had him live on my YouTube channel. Mickey Bay was like, "Yeah, K Nine, yeah, I remember Floyd talking about fighting you. He was talking about fighting you." So I was surprised because I thought Floyd didn't want no parts of this right here. I yeah. thought he didn't, he didn't want no parts. I thought he was. From that day that I saw him, and I was like, what's up, Floyd? And he did like this? I said, yeah, he's scared. So, yeah, I was close to fighting Floyd. You know, I was calling him out, um, but I didn't know. His teammate told me, you know, Mickey Bay, who was signed to the money team, told me Floyd was talking about fighting you. So I was surprised by that. And like I say, the jinx was Curry Spinks. He jinxed me not to get that fight on what I did to him. So I was too good for my own good. 
knocking him out the way I did. Now, if I would have won a fight and I wouldn't look as good and I would have barely won, then Floyd probably would have fought me. Same yeah. as when I fought Corey Spinks the second time. Corey the Jinx Spinks again. When I I was listen, they was looking at me to see if I didn't look good, if I didn't look strong, they was actually going to give me that fight against Canelo Alvarez. At that time, he was 154. And I think he was a champion. Or if he wasn't a champion, they was going to put him in the ring with me. But once I knocked out Corey Spinks again the way I did it, uh, my wife told me she even think that she showed me that Oscar De La Hoya did it one of his boys. He hit him on a, on a, on a, um, on an arm like we're not fighting him, man. He's too dangerous. He gonna mess our money up. So and then when when um Golden Boy they actually um flew me and my wife and my family out first class. You know, for they wanted to talk to us about, you know, a fight and they wanted mm. to do some business. And I was like, yes, we about to fight Canelo. And man, uh, they offered me somebody else. They offered me Ishay Smith or James Kirkland or Fernando Gulo. So they kept Canelo far away from me as possible, <laughs> as possible. And Miguel Cotto, he was another one. He was another one that was real close to fighting. Um, he used me, I think, um, you know, boxing is a dirty game. And yeah. um, they say you can't play boxing, but you can. Um, um, Miguel Cotto's people called me, and they had, I think, Austin Trout people on the phone. So they was like, yeah, K-9, you know, um, yes, um, Miguel wants to fight you, and um, we prepared to make an offer, and we're going to call you next tomorrow. And I was like, all right. So they had somebody on the phone and let them know, look, bro, we're going to fight the champ. If you don't take it, we're going to give you. So they gave Austin Trout way less more money to take the fight, let them know this is serious. If you don't take the fight, listen, you think we lying. We got Canel, we got K9, another world champ. So you take this money right here, we're gonna get it. Are we on? And so they used me the next day. They didn't even call me. I had to call them and they said, sorry, we fighting Austin Trout. And my okay. heart just fell on the floor. Yeah, I, I but, can imagine. Yeah, but, but hold on, let me say this. Before what goes around comes around. He he got back with me after I won a world title the second time. And um I turned him down. I played him like he played me, but even worse because, you know, Miguel Cotto is a diva. So he thinking, oh, you know, well, you know, we're going to offer K9 250000 And they even put my name and his name together on Box Rec. It's probably still up there to this day. And said that me and Miguel Cotto was going to fight. Even though I didn't say he was going to fight. I turned the fight down because he came to me and offered me $250,000. And I'm like, $250,000? You should come at me with 500000 just to start off with, because I'm a two-time world champ, and I could possibly mm -hmm. be on my last leg at 41 years old. I got to eat. I got to get paid. So mm -hmm. I turned that fight down. I could have fought Miguel Cotto for sure. So, yeah, for those that don't know, now you know. There we go. You heard it here first on Sports Chat with Matt. Absolutely. There you go, Matt. So, yeah, definitely. I got stories to tell. Wait till my book come out. It be coming out. I'm going to put it out here this Christmas. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Yes, Jesus forward name, to it. Yeah, appreciate you, man. Definitely. Man. And y'all follow my mans, man. Y'all show y'all my mans mad some love, man. Subscribe to this channel. Uh, hit the like button and hit the notifications. Or you're going to get bit by the K9. Oh, 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 that's no chat. <laughs> yes, sir. I might have to use that as an intro here. Yes, absolutely. You got to, champ. You got to. We so, all but, you got. know, I, I, I would have Mayweather. You know, I don't know if he ever fought somebody as strong as you, like like as aggressive and strong. I don't know if he could have avoided those power punches for 12 rounds. I know he's a defensive boxer, but for 12 rounds, I think eventually he would have, uh, he would have got some power punches off on him. I'm telling you, man, listen, styles make fights. Hmm. Floyd was smart. He was good at picking and choosing. Um, I remember Spinks him telling was perfect me, for him. Spinks huh? was perfect for him. Exactly. That's why he was, that's why he was there. I mean, real talk, this ain't no cap. He was there, uh, Mayweather, um, Don King, Lone, Floyd Mayweather, 500000 Because I, I, I think Floyd, you know, so had a money had money problems at the time. Uh, he was trying to get the contract with um with um, Bob Aaron, but he had just got the contract. So Don, Lone, 500000 I don't know if he ever got the money back. But then at the same time, he said, you going to fight for a world title. Just sign with me. We're going to do some business together. So I messed all that up. I messed all that up. 
And man, if I didn't look as good as I did, I would have got the Floyd Mayweather fight. Because Floyd would have been like, well, I'll fight K9. But stop it. He, he ain't wanna he ain't wanna see that egg. You know, real talk. Yes, sir. Yes, he could, sir. He could have been a better boxer. So what? But it don't matter. All you gotta be is the better fighter on that Saturday or that yep. Friday. And I would have beat him. I would have been, forget all that. You can roll your shoulder all you want to. I'm going to keep punching your shoulder. I'm going to hit your shoulder until you can't lift your arm up. So, there yeah, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. I like it. I like it. And uh, t- moving to some the current boxing scene right now, and talking a little bit more about Canelo, he's agreed to fight uh, Triple G again. How do you see that one playing out? Well, you know, I'm pulling for Triple G. Triple G seems to be a good dude, man. You know, hey, Canelo seems to be a good dude, too. But Jonathan Banks, who I grew up with, you know, in Crunks, um, he's really a homie of mine. He is training Triple G, so I'm pulling with tri- for Triple G because of that. But it's just, it just seems, you know, like Triple G has, you know, fought this best fight, you know, uh, earlier in his career. It just don't seem like he's the same Triple G he used to be. You know, um, you know, Father's time is undefeated, and um, yeah. you know, even though you know I'm pulling for him. You know, Jonathan Banks, my homie, can't fight for him. Now, you know, anything can happen because this will be the first time he has moved up from 160, so he'll finally be able to get a chance to really use the power that he naturally has. So um, it could be – it's going to be a good fight, but I just think that from from how good he – well, from how he looked compared to how Canelo's looked, even though Canelo lost his last fight, he went to be – he dared to be great and moved up in weight. So I just think that Canelo is just – Bigger now because you know, notice Canelo is moved up. Canelo moved up to yeah. fight him now. He's moving up to fight Canelo, so high times have changed. And you know, I, I don't want it to happen, but I think he might end up getting stopped. Man, Triple G, I hope he don't get stopped. I hope he win, but my hope, you know, what I'm saying it's just my hope. And but I just don't see it happening. I think um, Canelo is gonna fight him with, with anger. He's mad, you know, and show the yeah. world that you know, what I mean, that he still got it. And uh, I think you're going to take it all out, you know, on, on Triple G. But I hope I'm wrong. The next I got for you is Anthony Joshua Usyk. What do you see uh, taking place there? Um, well, you know, I, I feel like um, if it ain't broke, you know, why try to fix it? Or well, you can't fix it if it ain't broke. Anthony Joshua should have beat him the first time because he's the bigger fighter. Uh, Usyk really hasn't looked good uh, since moving up in heavyweight until he beat Anthony Joshua. Um, it's really, it's really um, not a good idea a lot of times to hire a new trainer going into a big fight where you don't, you don't have enough time to jail with him. That's going to be a very interesting fight. Um, very interesting fight. Um, if I had to say who I thought would probably win, I would say Anthony Joshua because the money is there for him and Tyson Fury to fight. And, um, you know, the fans want Tyson Fury to come back. He want to come back. The networks want him to come back. So I could see Anthony Joshua winning. I wouldn't care if it's by split decision, if it's by unanimous decision, if it's by knockout. Uh, Use is a great fighter, but um, he don't have that kind of country behind him like Anthony Joshua got behind him. And if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. I got Anthony Joshua winning. Then let's say Joshua wins. I'm going to tell you my thoughts. He's Mm -hmm. in trouble if he fights Tyson Fury. What do you think? You know what? To be honest with you, styles make fights. I get Anthony Joshua a better chance than Deontay Wilder because Styles make fights. I mm-hmm. think, man, listen, Joshua got a better chance at beating Fury than Wilder because Wilder has a style that for somebody that's going to stand in front of you. Joshua will stand right in front of Deontay Wilder and stop it. It's over. But okay. Tyson Fury was going to stand in front of him. Yeah. So I would I would give Anthony Joshua a great chance at beating him. And to be honest with you, by that time, the training that he has – um, Garcia will be done had enough time to jail with him. Sure. So I would I would say that's a maybe a 60-40 fight in favor of Tyson Fury, but we don't know the real Tyson Fury. You just never know if he's gonna box, if he ain't gonna box, if he's depressed, if it's Jesus for life. Um going into that fight, I might go with Anthony Joshua. You know, Joshua, that's why Joshua wants that fight so bad. He man, listen. He want that fight bad. I would say like a lamb, bad. He want it bad, <laughs> real bad. And he got a better chance. I'm not saying he gonna win, but he got a better chance than Wilder. I believe, in my opinion. 
the next uh, fight I want to talk about is Jake Paul. You have a history with Jake Paul. You you, you trained Ben Askren. Um, and Jake Paul, he prank called you. And I know you threw you wanted to throw your name in the hat to fight Jake. But uh, first off, talk about uh, what was it like being a part of that crazy buildup for that Jake Paul Ben Askren fight and training Ben, a guy who just came off hip surgery. Yes. And only having three months to train on the basics to fight a guy who's been doing it for over two years. What, what yeah. was that whole experience like for you? Oh, uh, man, it was it was the first time to actually um, train an elite uh, fighter at the time that had a name. You know, even though he's not a good striker, he's coming off um, hit replacement. It was a ch- it was a chance to put my name out there on the other side of the fence. You know, outside the ring as a trainer. And um, I was excited. The pay was good. You know, I got good money for that. But my whole thing is I wanted to get the victory. And um, I just don't think that um that um being Ashkren, you know, really respected um Jay Paul. Um, he you know, he was like, I was like, man, if you beat him, you can fight Floyd Mayweather next. And he was like, I'm not interested in fighting Floyd Mayweather. And I'm like, huh? You not <laughs> stop it. <laughs> so, you know. Right then and there. Then when I used to train him, he always had to leave at a certain time. And it's like, you know, you don't need to be at this appointment. You don't need to be doing this until, you know, we finish training, you know. And so when you're not training as hard, you know, when you're not as focused, you know, when it's just a payday for you. And then what really broke my heart and I still got respect for him. I got love for him. and I appreciate him. You know, he wouldn't take me to the fight when I asked him, you know, who you going to have work your corner? He was like, um, this guy named Biggie and Tyrone Woodley. And I was like, wah, wah, wah. I was hurt by that, for real, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think maybe because they was his homeboys. But well, you talking about UFC fighters. Come on, man. I'm a real boxer. What are you doing? You having a boxing match, not yeah. a UFC match. And I can just about guarantee you that he would have got past the first round. You know, um, they could. And then I don't even think Tyron Woodley really wanted him to get past the first round because who fought him next? Tyron Woodley. Woodley. So why would you take somebody that that really don't want you to win, you know, to fight Jake Paul? You know, oh, he's the homie. He's the it is what it is, man. I appreciate um, being Ashcreen. He he showed me some love. He gave me an opportunity. But um, that fight really wasn't on me. You know, I did help him with his hands. But you yeah. can't keep it when you're really not a striker and you just had hit replacement. And then I'm not even working your corner. I would have been a real good coach for him. And I would have told him, step to the side, quit leaning back. You know, he kept, he'll bring me in camp for one week, but then send me home. Won't bring me back again for three more weeks. Then send me home. And it's like, you need to have me at your, your camp, the whole camp. And you'd have been surprised. He'd have looked real good. He'd have had spurs when you'd have been like, man, look at being Ashkin. You know what yeah. I mean? But. Like I say, man, you know, and then what I would have done when I saw that, you know, not saying he would have won because of the hit replacement. He and, you know, it take a, a nice little while to get actually good with them hands when you ain't really got hands. But I told him, listen, man, grab them and slam them so they can realize you a UFC fighter. I don't mess your money up. You ain't going to get DQ, but they're going to be like, man, it ain't going to look as bad as how it was when he got stopped. Yeah. Um, and what, what was he doing in between those weeks where you he sent you home? How was he training and preparing while you were gone? I don't know because we really didn't um, communicate or stay in touch at the time. Um, I don't know exactly what he was doing. He was training, don't get me wrong, but he was very limited at what he could do. Um, he couldn't really run you know, real fast, no sprints because of his hip. Um, I know his arm, his arm was hurt, you know, and I, when he threw a jab, he, you know, he couldn't throw it all the way out because he had messed his elbow up a little bit. So he was injured. He was really injured. You know, it wasn't even 100% um, on being Ashkin. But being Ashkin, you know, he was like, man, come on, man. It's Jake Paul. So, you know, he went into it like, it's Jake Paul, bro. He ain't, you know, he's a YouTuber. And this YouTuber is taking boxing serious. He's training for real. He yeah. done shut down a YouTube channel. And um, you got somewhere to be. So, you know, it is what it is. And at this point, Jake has transcended YouTube boxing. I, I, I... And definitely now that he's taking on a heavyweight who's 12 and one, who has over a hundred uh, amateur fights, he's a, Jake's yeah. a boxer now. And even, yeah. even back then at that time, you, you saw, if you watched a Nate Robinson fight, you saw, you saw some skills yeah. like that empowered. I mean, I don't care who you are. I have to turn someone's light switch off 
you yeah. got to have some pop. I don't, yes. I don't care how what what kind of novice he is in the sport. He had pop. And, yeah, like you said, I, I don't think Ben respected what Jake brought to the table enough because he's the YouTuber, the Disney kid. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and, and going off of that, what do you think of what Jake has done since then? Man, I respect Jake. Jake is good for boxing. Jake, oh, listen, Jake is better for boxing than who – whoever he got in the ring with and probably whoever he ever stepped in the ring with because he's bringing a whole different audience to boxing. I train a lot of people because they want to be boxers because of Jake Paul. Jake Paul is good for boxing. He's great for boxing. Um, the women, women should be get, applauding him because yeah. he gave Amanda Serrano her biggest purse. You know what I'm saying? He stepped up and, and, and put his name out there for ladies boxing, women boxing. So, Jake Paul is good for boxing. I hope he continues to win. You know what I mean? The longer he stays winning, the better the sport's going to be. We're going to get more younger eyes on the sport of boxing. You know what I mean? So, hey, I hope he keep on doing good, you know? Now, no, now I guess his opponent. I know his opponent, so, you know, I'm going to be pulling for him too. But may the best man win. But as long as he continues to win and do good in boxing, man, it's good for boxing. 100%. And give me your prediction for his upcoming fight against the guy – you know, Jake Paul, you know, every single fight, there's been a criticism. Okay, this guy is smaller than you. Ben can't strike. Tyrone is, you know, past his prime. Now, this guy, he's 31 years old. He's six foot three. He's weighed as heavy as 260 pounds, over 100 amateur fights. Jake has six fights total, amateur and pro. Um, what's your prediction for this fight? How do you see it going? Man, listen, um, Jake Paul is one of the best of all time. At matchmaking, he has picked the right fights early on in his career. Um, it's hard to go against him. Uh, I, I would like to see, you know, both guys training camps before I actually say who I think gonna win. Because why would he get in the ring with somebody that he know he can lose to when he has way more to lose than the game? Yeah. So he's picking, um, you know, his opponent, uh, Hasim Robin Jr. for a reason. You know, Hasim Robin Jr. You know. Um, you know, maybe he was doing something that made him pick him, you know. Uh, sparring is one thing, you know. An actual fight is another thing. I, I would have to definitely say I would go with Hussein Rodman Jr. Um, to win a fight. But um, Showtime is not going to mess their money up. They trying to recoup all the money they can from Jake Paul. So if it goes to a decision, I can't see them giving it to, you know, uh, Hussein Rodman Jr., but then again, guess what? Jay Paul will still have the same followers he got. So, you know, hey, they could do a rematch, if it, especially if it's a good fight. Um, I, it's just it's really hard to say who I think going to win because, you know, he's being protected because he's protecting himself. And so is Showtime. Showtime would be like, ah, nope. They would have said, no, you can't fight him. But it had to be something in that camp, you know, in that sparring session that made them say he can get him, you know? And you know, I just, I don't know, man. That's a 50-50 fight, in my opinion, because even though his opponent has all these fights and all this experience, in his last fight, he was knocked out. Yeah. So you ain't going to go, I don't care who it is, you ain't going to go into that fight with the same confidence. As soon as you get hit with one punch, especially if it's a good punch, you can go back to thinking about the last fight you was just in. <laughs> and, man, you know, so, man, hold on. This, hold on, am I still, this ain't no Jake Paul. <laughs> yes, it is. So, hey, I'm going to say 50-50. Yeah, and, and it surprised me that Jake Paul opened up as the betting favorite. Um, and that, that amazed me. Like, when I first saw the fight was announced, I'm like, Jake could get seriously injured. But then I watched the film. I'm like, okay, now I kind of see it. No disrespect um, to, to Rockman Jr., but I just noticed his hand speed is not super quick. I, I, just to be 100% honest, he does not have great hand speed. Jake does have some hand speed. Um, Jason had the speed advantage. I don't think Rockman's going to have fought a lot of guys as quick as Jake. And then, then Jake has a great equalizer in the, the right hand where I think that can, uh, neutralize some of the experience kind of like, like we're talking about. Exactly. Um, um I've seen Rodman is not a former world champion, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Junior. So, you know, if he was a former world champion, it'd be something different. He's still a baby 100%. in the game himself, you know? Yeah. And you gotta, you gotta remember Jake Paul has fought on a bigger scene than Hasim Robin Jr. So yeah. you would think that most experience goes to Hasim Robin Jr. Well, I think it's even experience because 
on a bigger level, a bigger stage, we got Jake Paul. He's been on a bigger stage in a lot of things. You got to think about it. He has a YouTube channel, so every time you do anything, it's the big yep. stage. So he's ready for this moment. His first fight was a sold-out arena against another YouTuber. Um, his last two Tyron Woodley fights sold out arenas. It's, yeah, like you said, it's one of those things, like, what happens to a guy who's never fought on nearly as big of a stage when he makes that ring walk? Like, what kind of nerves, anxiety does he feel in that moment? And does Absolutely. that, you know, equalize things a little bit? The pressure's on Hussein Rodman Jr. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, next I want to get into the lightning round as we close the interview off. Um, so, just answer as quick as you can. And, yeah, right. let, you ready? Ready to roll? Oh, 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 let's go, champ! Let's uh, go! <laughs> Yes, sir. All right. Who's the hardest puncher you ever faced? Um, Bassagorov. Zeriak Bassagorov. Okay. Favorite holiday? Um, my birthday. There we go. Favorite quote? The first should be last. The last should be first. All right. Quickest boxer you fought? Uh, qu quickest hands? Quickest hands? Uh, Michael Clark. Quickest movement quickest around the movement. ring? Oh, um, um, Yuri Foreman. Favorite movie? Um, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Uh, favorite boxer growing up? Mike Tyson. Favorite food? Cheesecake. All right, your favorite boxing workout? Um, shadow boxing. Least favorite boxing workout? Going to the gym. <laughs> no, let me see. Um, least favorite, uh, least one. Hmm. Ooh, that's a good one. I have one. I don't have one. Okay. And then yeah. um, losing weight. Can I say that? <laughs> losing. Oh weight. yeah. Yeah. No, that's brutal. And then I got three more for you. Uh, okay. what, what was your dream matchup that you would like to face in the ring? Floyd Mayweather. We both from Michigan. Come on, man. We okay. both from Michigan. Man, I would have did so big. Listen, he from Grand Rapids. So I'm from Detroit. Come on, man. And at the time, when I was on the contender, I had as many fans as Floyd, if not more. The contender mm. was huge. It was. Like, the range was unreal. I'm telling you, United Kingdom, Germany, they was R -R -R K9. And I fought over there at K9 Boxing. Let's <laughs> go at the sports talk with my man's Mac. Let's go, champ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I got two more questions for you. What's your favorite place in the world? Oh, man. My front room. <laughs> my room. Uh, we go, favorite place in the world? Man, heaven. Okay. And then the last one is favorite animal. Favorite animal. Oh, 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 let's go, champ. Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> oh. <laughs> let's Good go, deal. Champ. Well, yeah. no, I. Kate, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I had a great time talking to you. And yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you too. Oh, my second, my next second, or probably on the same level, I would have to say a silverback. Okay. Yeah. Silverback up there with me. Yeah, I like the silverback. We had a silverback that was six foot seven at the zoo. You know what I mean? Oh, Detroit Zoo. He was six foot seven. Boy, no joke. Monster. Gorilla. For real. <laughs> appreciate you, man. Yeah. If, yeah, if don't forget to subscribe to my dog channel, y'all. Y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Check out Sports Talk with Matt. Er, er, er. Subscribe. If you don't subscribe, you're going to get knocked out. And hit the like button and the notifications at Sports Talk with Matt. Er.